so yesterday I woke up uh, to this view of the Matterhorn, and I took the train up to Gornagrat, and right at the top of the mountain, when I get out of the train station, and we a little bit, I, I look at this amazing view on the right, and this guy just pops up and just you know, takes a look at us. Uh, so I shot these with my iPhone yesterday. But uh, thank you very much for uh, the invite, Tom. This is an amazing venue. What an incredible place. And I'm looking forward to flying tomorrow with uh, Air Zermatt and getting the helicopter and, uh, and go up and skiing. I'm going to share with you a different perspective of the airway. So uh, for those of you who don't know my background, I started out in emergency medicine in a small city on the East Coast called New York. Uh, I, I grew up in Manhattan, and when I was growing up, there was this idiot who lived in Queens. His name was Donald Trump, and he was a joke. Uh, and, and I just want you to know that two-thirds of Americans did not vote for this man. Um, so I... I, I <laughs> I'm blaming the Russians, but uh, no, but uh, yeah, I come from Trump land, but uh, I'm hoping that America will wake up. You know, we have great capacity for change and we surprise the world sometimes how quickly we change. So hopefully by this time next year, uh, we will be in a different place. All right, enough said of that. Um, in the airway game, so I grew up in New York City in emergency medicine and I felt terrible about my own skill sets as an airway manager. I was only as good as my last airway I didn't really understand the game. There's all this voodoo about the airway. There's all this um, voodoo about sedation. And so along the way, I came up with this idea for a head-mounted camera. I started, I called it the airway cam. I started imaging direct laryngoscopy. That led me to do cadaver work. And now every month of my life for the last 19 years, every month, every month for 19 years, I have 20 bodies in a room. And I run the world's largest cadaveric airway workshop. I see dead people all the time. Um, and it wasn't enough to do it every month in Baltimore. I started taking human bodies, taking the arms off, taking the, at the hemicorpectomizing them and shipping them frozen around the world. So I started doing these in Australia and New Zealand. So now I just have this crazy life of, you know, dead people and, uh, and, and cadaver labs. And, and then I, I went from the inner city as an eMERGE doc to working in the middle of nowhere. So I now work 90 miles out of Denver and Colorado. And the reason why I took that job is because my son's nearby. I call him up and say, hey, Matt, you want to go skiing? But I work 24-hour shifts. I work seven a month. I do that in Colorado and in New Hampshire when I'm not flying around doing cadaveric stuff. Um, OK, so the, this lecture that I'm doing today is different than any other lecture I've done. We've hit 21 minutes. I have seven minutes a slide. I have three slides. So the clock, and every seven minutes, we're going to go to a new slide. So for the next seven minutes, now six minutes and 40 seconds, we're going to talk about prioritization. What are the priorities of airway management? Miracle on the Hudson, Cactus 1549. They've lost, they've lost both engines. They are banking left. There are only three rules in aviation emergency. You aviate, you navigate, you communicate, meaning you control the plane, you control the direction it goes, and you communicate with the ground. There are no algorithms. What is it about medicine that we try to put everything on an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper with six inch type, we squint at it, and we try to read this algorithm? We think there is safety in algorithms. What I was taught when I was younger as an eMERGE doc is the more you know, the better you are. Well, in fact, I don't think that's true. I think you watch these people, particularly the novice trainees, and their head is so fat with algorithms. They get in the middle of these clinical situations and they are deer in headlights. They can't keep it all straight. And then you watch these people, you watch people who are great clinicians, the people who go through the sickest of the sick, and they have this lightness, this just casualness to the whole approach. And I think that the key is not memorizing algorithms. Not only do I believe algorithms do not work, I think they cognitively burden us so we perform worse. I think what we need in the world of airway management is priorities. So what are the priorities of airway management? What would you say is the first priority of airway management? I'm going to just throw it out there because I've only got four minutes left on this topic. And I'm going to say it's oxygenation, OK? Priority number one is oxygenation. Now, priority number two, my whole career has been ventilation, right? You oxygenate, you ventilate. You oxygenate, you ventilate. 
We're, we're so into throwing masks and bagging them, LMAs and all this. I'm going to suggest to you that the second priority of airway management is not ventilation. It's very rare, in fact, that we need to ventilate. You need to ventilate the diabetic ketoacidosis patient who is severely acidotic, who you're inducing. You know, the salicylate poisoned. The people who have a metabolic acidosis so severe, they have a compensatory respiratory alkalosis. But in everybody else, the lack of the diaphragm movement has nothing to do with oxygen. So I would argue the next most important thing is, in fact, avoidance of fluids. Fluids are the enemy of everything. In the world of airway management, you die by hypoxia, and the usual co-conspirator is fluids. So my friend Jim Ducanto, who was a vomitologist of the highest order, the, the man travels around thinking about puke. He actually travels with this glob of green puke that he makes up wherever he goes. He's insane. Wait till you see this, if you haven't seen Jim's thing. He's, he's very vomit-centric. Um, now, to be fair, in my cadaver lab for the last 19 years, we go around the room in the morning, <laughs> suction all the cadaver juice out, and then we recre recreate vomitology drills where we pour it back in and we actually use these various techniques that Jim shows. But I think the priorities of airway management are oxygenate, avoidance of fluids, and ventilation in the rare case. So the question is, how do you avoid fluids? How do you avoid fluids? And I think the answer is, it's very simple. You put the head higher than the stomach. You know, what is it about the flat position that we have bought into? I'm blaming the surgeons. It's the surgeon's fault because they want them flat on their back with no tone. Well, that is a recipe for death in the airway game. That's the problem. It's the problem is the surgeons. I'm going to blame them. So, you know, if the stomach, and in America where two-thirds of people are obese, uh, if the stomach is higher than the mouth and you induce somebody and you relax them, the fluids go down. You know, there is a reason why everybody in respiratory distress goes like this, but we want to recreate this position. We want the head higher than the stomach in everybody. So, you know, I get these trauma patients, and if they're really, really sick and hypotensive, I'm bending them in half. The head is still coming up higher. I'm lifting the legs, you know. But in everybody else, I don't intubate flat. I never intubate flat. And so we have to think about fluids. And that gets us to ventilation, right? You know, we bag people a lot before we intubate them. Now, I am very keen on O's up the nose. I'm not into bagging. I bag almost nobody. In uh, the United States these days, I don't know if you're aware, but 65,000 people died of opiate overdose. 65,000 last year. If you combine suicide in the United States and opiates, 100,000 people a year. 100,000 people a year dying by overdose and suicide in the United States. That's insane. Anyway, I get these ashen gray people who are heroin overdosed, fentanyl overdosed. In the past, they'd come in flat on the stretcher, bag, 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 while we got stuff ready. Now, I sit them upright, I pull on their mandible, I crank up the O's. They are completely apneic, and within seconds, their oxygenation corrects, as long as they have a pulse, through this miracle of apneic oxygenation. But I suggest to you, this business of prioritization, we really need to rethink. It, it's just assumed that you oxygenate, you ventilate. But I think it should all be about oxygenation, number one, avoidance of fluids, number two. And in the rare case, we have to ventilate. But, uh, you know, the amazing thing about this Cactus 1549 is the acceptance of reality. What most pilots would have done is turn back to the airport you just left because that's what you're taught to do. But he knew that if he tried to make LaGuardia too steep on the flaps, the plane goes sideways and he could no longer control the plane. And then, as he's looking out and says, can we make Teterboro? You know, you have a runway available for me in Teterboro in Jersey. Flight control says, yes, Teterboro 13 is available. And he looks down, and in this moment of calm, he says, negative, can't make Teterboro, going down in Hudson. He accepts the reality of the situation. And I think what the best clinicians do is, they don't lie, they just kind of accept that reality of the situation. You know what, most what most pilots would have done is pull back on the yoke and try to make that flight go to Jersey. And they would have just hit the port of Newark. They would have smeared it all over northern Jersey. Thousands of people would have died. He just accepted the reality. And I think that's what the best clinicians do. But prioritization. Think about what's best. All right, so we're up to 14 minutes. We're going to switch to my next slide. Um, 
It took me a long time to appreciate that this man who's pulling off his mask here is not stupid. In fact, he wants to live, right? How many of you have met this person, right? You've met him, right? He's pulling the mask off, and you're thinking, what? You're thinking, like, WTF, like, put the freaking mask on. It's helping you, right? You have this argument with him. Sir, it's oxygen. It's helping you. And what does he say? I can't breathe, right? And what, what do you think? You know, when I was seriously burned out in emergency medicine, I can tell you what I thought. I thought the guy was trying to die on me. That's, that's very egocentric. When I was in a generous mood, I would say, well, you know, the man might understand oxygen, but because his brain is now deprived of oxygen, he's not thinking clearly, right? But when I was really mean, I thought he was either trying to die on me or he's just stupid. And in Emerge, there's lots of stupid. I mean, I've seen all kinds of stupid. Um, really. I mean, you guys see this if you're in Emerge. You, you see stupid. Stupid is not rare. Stupid is, in fact, often present. That's what lands them in emergency. You know, drinking power tools, you know? Not good, you know? Like all kinds of stupid. So I used to think this man was stupid. But what if he were to say to me, Professor Levitan, are you aware, sir, that this non-rebreather mask that you have attached to my face is delivering 15 liters a minute? And in fact, the negative inspiratory flow in my trachea and severe respiratory distress is 30, 40, 50, 60 liters a minute. Therefore, sir, you're not meeting my negative inspiratory flow needs. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> Furthermore, Professor Levitan, are you aware that this non-rebreather mask, in fact, does not have any CO2 absorption mechanism? This isn't a diving system. This isn't the OR. You're not being cared for by Dr. Christensen or Dr. Teo or Dr. Ducanto. There is no flush valve here with continuous flow, um, you know, that's going to then absorb CO2 uh, when you exhale. In fact, sir, by clamping the mask to my face, what you are doing <laughs> is actually forcing me to rebreathe my exhaled carbon dioxide. The effective inspired oxygen by clamping this to my face is, in fact, only 55%. Excuse me? Furthermore, Professor Levitant, are you aware by holding the mask here, in fact, sir, what I am doing is I'm blowing O's up the nose and it is not blocking my air egress. In fact, sir, my inspired oxygen holding the mask in this position is higher than the what you're asking me to do. Holy crap. You know what I've con c concluded after 25 years of watching people die in front of me? They want to live. They want to live. <laughs> people want to live. And we have not paid attention. What we've been doing in the airway game, I was taught my whole career, head tilt. Head tilt, right? Open the airway, tilt the head. Has, how many of you have ever seen anybody in Emerge come in going, I can't breathe? <laughs> they do not show up looking at the ceiling. If you want to swallow a sword, you want to swallow a sword, put your head back, swallow the sword. But that's for sword swallowing. For everybody else, the head is forward relative to the chest. People ask me, what's the right position for airway management? Just look at nature. Look at what patients do. So if you bring your head square, straight back, try opening your jaw. It doesn't open very much. <laughs> but with your head forward, your jaw just lollygags open. You know, you look at the highest aerobic activities on the planet. I, I haven't done enough climbing in the Alps. I, I regret it. But I have been around the world above 20,000 feet half a dozen times. I used to think it was in exhaustion and fatigue that I was carrying these heavy packs and I would take a step at 20,000 feet and I'd be bent over. And then it was only 10 years ago, prone positioning. Holy smokes, you look at the fastest animals on the planet, cheetahs, racehorses, you look at things that go fast, their heart sits on their sternum, their posterior lungs work. There is a reason on the Tour de France when you are, you know, you're going over the high Alps, you're breathing through your nose and out your mouth and you're in a prone position. How long did it take medicine to figure out what animals have evolved over millions of years? You know, it, it's fascinating. I think we have been fighting what has been right in front of us. I am looking out at you and you are all breathing through your nose. You're not breathing through your mouth. How long did it take us to realize that O's up the nose is the key? The first thing when I see somebody in respiratory distress is a nasal cannula. And I'm not talking a fancy nasal cannula, I'm talking the 50 cent nasal cannula. Um, 
So 50 cent nasal cannula, just a regular one. I can turn that flow rate up 15 liters. But when you get to jet speed, in the US, it hits about 70 liters a minute coming out of the wall with a standard 50 cent cannula. It's amazing. Now, if you have Vapotherm, if you have Airvo, if you have the high flow humidified, but we should be breathing through the nose, not through the mouth. Um, so I, I think the patients know better than us. You know, this woman who I took pictures of laying flat on her back, after a few seconds, she said to me, this isn't very comfortable, I can't breathe. There is a lot of weight on her chest. The top of her lung is collapsing the bottom of her lung. Her diaphragm is up here at the nipple line. That's bad. I set her up, everything falls forward. She goes, wow, this is quite comfortable. She was being admitted for cellulitis. She rolled upstairs, and we got a call from the charge nurse. The patient wants us to rebuild her ramp. Is this a new thing in the ER? Um, anyway, the patient insisted for the next three days that her ramp be rebuilt. But, but I think we just need to look at nature. We've been fighting ourselves. The patients do know better than us. All right, we're down to seven minutes. If you could advance my slide. I want to get to what I think is the most important consequential idea of this talk, and there's too much content here to give it to you in a, in a single slide in seven minutes, but I'm going to try. Um, what should be the response to hypoxia? You know, I work in Colorado, I work in northern New England, I work, I'm a recovering consultologist. Most of my career I worked in tertiary care places, and you know what I got good at? Picking up a phone and calling a specialist. I was a consultologist. Um, and now I work in the middle of nowhere. There's nobody to call. Three nights ago, four in the morning, I wake up, guy with indigestion, and he has tombstones across his inferior leads. And I have a chat with him and the wife, no phone call to cardiology. TNK gets put in, and chest in time. You know, he goes Brady down to 30. Uh, his, his blood pressure goes to 60, and then his vessels open up, his EKG normalized, right as the helicopter finally came and took him away. But I, I, I am a recovering consultologist. But I now work with no backup at all. So I'm working up in northern New England. I have a gentleman who is, you know, medium-sized American, about 300 pounds. And um, it's, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Uh, but anyway, the guy's 300 pounds. His shoulder is dislocated. It took an hour to get to our hospital. And he's screaming. And, you know, right as he comes in, there's me, the nurse, the wife, and the patient. The, the patient finally arrives, and the wife says to me, hey, doc, He's got a really high pain tolerance. Okay, thanks. Good to know. Anyway, he's crying like a baby. He's got 30 milligrams of morphine on. 30 milligrams of morphine. And he's still crying. I start pulling on his shoulder. This is before the Cunningham technique, by the way, which I think is great. But uh, this guy's been out an hour and a half. I give him drugs, and I combine my secret weapon, which is diazepam. You know, Diazepam turns people to jelly. I mean, propofol is great too, but uh, I didn't have it then. I had diazepam and I had narcotics, which is a great combination until you give them too quickly and then the patient gets apneic. Well, so he's, I'm pulling on the arm and he's screaming and the wife is, Doc, can you give him some more meds? Sure. Anyway, everybody's getting just exasperated and I say, come on, give him a little more, give him a little more, give him a little more. And I committed a high crime. Impatience. I don't let the drugs work. Well, notice, right about then I notice, hey, he's starting to relax. And I turn to the nurse and say that. And he goes, Rich, you should look up at the monitor. So the monitor is going bing, bing, bing. He's flat line uh, in terms of his breathing. Flat line. His pulse ox is now 60. What could be bad, right? He's flat on his back. He's 300 pounds. His pulse ox is 60. Bing, bing. The, the wife says to me, Rich, or he says, Doctor, are we okay? I go, oh yeah, we're fine. Um, so I, I pull on the arm, I reduce the shoulder because I think maybe the pain response is going to actually wake him up. Well, his shoulder goes back in, apneic. So I have option A, walk around to the head of the bed and do what you've all been told. Bag the patient, right? That's what we've been told. I could run up to the head of the bed, take the mask out, fumble around while, you know, I'm stressed trying to do this, start bagging him, push the mask down, try to lift up on the mandible. It's as smooth as walking in ski boots. You know, like bag mask ventilation in a flat position, 
sucks. It doesn't work. It's a poorly engineered procedure. Instead, I go to option B. We hoist them up the bed, we put our backs into it, we lift up the stretcher. I water ski off his mandible. I take my entire body weight and I pull his head off the bed like this, leaning back. I crank up the O's to jet speed with the nasal cannula. And within seconds, you know, by the way, if I had done the face mask, you know what would have happened? I would have been there and he'd have been like this. You know that cheek flap? And by the way, think about the mechanics. His, his abdomen's enormous. Flat on his back, his upper airway is obstructed. The middle airway, the larynx, the trachea, naturally stented open. But the real problem with flat positioning is in the lower airway. Diaphragm up here. With anesthesia and induction, and I didn't give him paralysis, but you lose about 50% of your FRC. He has no area for gas absorption. He's going to die. You couldn't bag that man. But I set him up, pulled on the mandible, boom, we fix him. O's up the nose. I think we need to re-engineer our practices. The response to hypoxia should be not to bag. It should be to sit him up, open the upper airway by pulling on the mandible, blow O's up the nose. Open the lower airway by having the diaphragm go down. And run enough oxygen, you blast open the soft palate, you shoot it down into the trachea. Let's talk about incrementalized direct laryngoscopy. In front of you, you all have laryngoscopes. You have pens, and we're going to pick them up. And I want you to repeat after me and pick it up with two fingers. So you've been all told, right? When we did laryngoscopy, when you went and you first learned, you were told to grab this thing like this, right? And come in from the right and go like that, right? That's what we were all told. And what that does is it makes it hit or miss. In a world of life and death, I don't want hit or miss. I want highly reliable, small, reproducible, reliable steps. The way to be a great laryngoscopist, it doesn't matter if you have video, it doesn't matter if you have direct. You pick it up with two fingers. So two fingers, left-handed instrument, hold it at the base, all the way down where the bottom of the pen is. Let's see it here. Straight out, guys. If you pick it up in the right, you don't get to intubate. Sorry. Pick it up in the left. It's only a left-handed instrument. So repeat after me in Japanese. Each. Each. All right. Knee. So when we go from each to knee, what we're doing is we're going to our two fingers to changing our grip to force down the blade. Doesn't matter what device this is. So the whole first part of laryngoscopy is you come down and you go midline on everybody. Midline on everybody. You go back to the old school. You go back to Kiernings. You go back to Bruning, uh, Kirstein. You go to Brunings. The Germans and the Austrians who pioneered this procedure, 1895, turn of the century. They said, go midline. Find the uvula. It points to the epiglottis. So I do this with every instrument. Tick, 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 tick. Uvula points to epiglottis. Just one step at a time. That's the key to life, by the way. You know, the key to procedures, the key to get through a shift, the key to get through your career is one step at a time. Incrementalization. So we're going to go with two fingers. We go down. There's the uvula. You take your yank hour. There's the epiglottis edge. You stay on your two fingers. You control the tongue. If you're using a DL instrument, you get the tongue over to the left. If you're staying with the glycoscope, you stay midline. But then you switch from each, knee, force down the blade, san, bimanual laryngoscopy. Your hand comes onto the neck, you take the tip of the blade and you go like that, and it changes the mechanics. You know what the secret of video laryngoscopy is? Aside from the Pentax airway scope, they are all indirect elevators. So you need to get that sweet spot just right by going tick, 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 epi uvula, epiglottis, controlling tongue. You're locking this into that sweet spot, and I do that in every one of them. Um, anyway, the surgical airway, I don't have time to go into, but I treat that highly incrementalized. We're going to practice that at the bar with drinking and scalpels. No, actually, we made an executive decision that I will have my surgical models, but we're not going to have knives. So we can drink liberally. Um, all right, I just want to end on this last slide just to keep this... Um, short here since uh, Michael advertised coming to Copenhagen, which I highly recommend. Copenhagen is an amazing city. But if you like this kind of bucket list, unique in the world places, and uh, I would put Zermatt on that list, unquestionably. But uh, the Tetons are amazing. You have incredible mountains, and then you have these things that are as large as minivans called bison, and they walk right in front of you. Uh, it's an amazing venue. So uh, 
Anyway, maybe I will see you in the Tetons. But uh, come up at the airway workshop. We've got some surgical airway models, and we'll play with that. Uh, but no scalpels. Safety first. <laughs> All right. Um, do we have time for questions? Or uh, I don't know. Up to you. Uh, we'll take it at the bar. At the bar. All right. Don't want to go to Gozaimas. Thank you.